Good afternoon and welcome to Who's Right. This is Sandra McFadden and today we have for our guest the Senate Majority Leader Scott Fitzgerald and I'm so glad to welcome you to our show. Thank you very much. It's so nice to have you here. Good to be with you. You have had a six-year career in the Senate? Six. Actually, I was elected in 1994 uh -huh. and then was sworn in in 95 and have served ever since then in the uh, 13th District. In the 13th District. Right. And how many years is that total? Well, uh, coming up on 17 in January. 17? So. Yes. Oh, wow. Was right. I off? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been a good career. 17 years. First, you were co-chair of the minority leader, right? Well, I've had a number of leadership positions over uh -huh. the years, uh, including co-chair of the Finance Committee, uh -huh. which uh, I think is a very important position for any legislator who ultimately uh, has the opportunity to serve in that slot, because uh, it really gives you kind of an inner understanding of the workings of the budget and I think uh, pays off huge dividends in the future. But I've also been minority leader of my caucus mm -hmm. and uh, like you said, cur currently serving as majority leader. Right, yes. And you also have a military background, don't you? I do, I had 27 years in the U.S. Army Reserves and oh uh, yeah, I was very fortunate to make it all the way up to Lieutenant Colonel That's and right. had a battalion command and then retired. Uh, some days I miss it, uh, some, some <laughs> days I don't, so it, uh, it just depends. Yes. So what are you currently working on in the, um, in the Senate at this point? Well, we're, we're just wrapping up our actions on the full state budget, right? which is a uh, massive document, as many of your viewers uh, certainly are aware of, Right. Uh, but it's a long, kind of drawn-out process for the legislature, and that's by design. Uh, the individual pieces of the governor's budget are pulled apart and then sometimes unchanged, but in other circumstances reassembled with mm -hmm. uh, what the legislature thinks are improvements. Mm -hmm. And when it's all said and done, we give it back to the governor, obviously, after the floor debate, and uh, he has an opportunity to veto some of that language. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's currently what the governor is considering, is whether or not to veto certain parts of what we passed in the Senate uh, last week. I see. Okay. Well, right now we're going through recall elections, right. as you know. Right. And um, I'm curious to know where where this really where the nut cracked with this. Um, Senator, I mean Governor Walker, when he came into office, he started right away working on his legislation and um, can you kind of walk us through what first happened when he came in and the legislation that he passed and when it got into trouble when it started really kind of irritating the left mm -hmm. and making them getting them up in arms yeah I think um, you know one of the things that we pledged on the campaign trail uh, last summer all the way through the November elections was to make sure that we first of all got the state back on track fiscally mm -hmm. and also returned what we would consider honesty in budgeting which I had see, seen kind of erode as not only the co-chair of the Finance Committee but as minority leader really over the last decade uh, so it was something that we felt strong about and the other was to get the economy moving and, and come up with some innovative pieces of legislation that we thought would fit the bill or ultimately kind of lay the groundwork for that to happen. So really, uh, starting in January 3rd after the inauguration, uh, you know, we opened the door on a special session on job creation and the economy. And we passed uh, nine separate bills that uh, ultimately were signed into law by the governor. And when was this? When did those bills get this passed? This was in January. January. This was in the month of January, right. And those nine bills, uh, some, some signed into law later than others, but all of them have ultimately been signed into law, which I think ultimately will, will jumpstart the state's economy and, and get it moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. The budget repair bill, the controversial piece of that, the collective bargaining, right. that was something that was discussed in and around February. Uh -huh. uh, we were very close to the trigger that typically says, listen, the legislature needs to revisit the state's budget because we're in the red. 
Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of discussion in and around that. Uh -huh. But one of the concepts that the governor introduced during that discussion was the idea of curtailing collective bargaining. Mm -hmm. uh, leaving in place collective bargaining for wages, but the elimination of all other items where there's some costs associated to those items for local levels of government, school boards, uh, city councils certainly, and county boards. Right. And uh, many of us who have served in the legislature for some time knew that it would be very controversial mm -hmm. and knew that there would be you know a lot of people within the unions that would be very upset by it right so as we kind of move forward uh, we thought there would be a floor debate and a discussion about it and ultimately you know we'll see if the votes were there mm -hmm. uh, and that's when the Democrats in the Senate decided to leave town uh -huh. and they left for almost three weeks right. so it was um, obviously unprecedented and um, a very uh, turbulent time, I guess you could say, right. during those three weeks when I, as majority leader, was making a lot of different decisions in and around how the Senate would operate, how it would function, uh, many considerations about the safety as the crowds continued to grow at the Capitol, right. and uh, made a lot of decisions that, uh, quite honestly, I never saw myself making uh, really? before this all happened. Yeah. Such as? A lot of the security stuff, I think more than anything. Mm. You know, uh, making decisions about the welfare of uh, staff, mm -hmm. not just my staff, but the other legislators' staff on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of meetings with law enforcement, a lot of meetings with the DOA Secretary Mike Hipsch. Mm. Uh, you know, talk about the Capitol and whether or not uh, think there was a safe environment. Mm -hmm. A lot of those decisions that I just never saw myself being dragged into. And were there a lot of risks that were out there? There were concerns. I mean, I, I think that ultimately, you know, we're very fortunate that we made it through this entire episode kind of in the state's history without any significant, uh, you know, what I would say are life-threatening injuries or, or somehow that the crowds, you know, grew to the point where, you know, some of the death threats that were levied against some of the legislators right. uh, never happened. I mean, right. we're very fortunate, I think that we made it through that period without anything happening. But we're still on, we're still on high alert and we're still very oh, sure. concerned. You know, those threats continue. And uh, it was a tough time for legislators' families, I think, as well, mm -hmm. as this whole thing unfolded. So everyone still is basically really nervous and concerned. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Yeah, I think, you know, we, it's comforting to see kind of the levels of the crowds uh, dwindle at the Capitol mm -hmm. and kind of get back into a normal, uh, everyday kind of atmosphere mm -hmm. with school groups coming and going. And, and uh, you know, ultimately though, until the metal detectors are gone and, yeah. and the troopers are gone, it still is um, a much different environment than I've ever experienced. And I think many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle feel the same way. Right. So now we're into the recall elections, and we have six senators, nine really, that are up for re-election, but six Republicans and three Democrats. Right. So what do we do to get our, nine, our six Republicans re-elected? I mean, they are sitting out on a fence and um, very right. vulnerable. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that one of the things that we continue to do is, is make sure that our message is clear, that ultimately the Republicans did what we said we were going to do, which was get the state back on track. And that means get our fiscal house in order, like I said earlier. And with the delivery of this budget, we have eliminated a structural deficit that had grown to somewhere between 3 and $3.6 billion, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, and then also... Uh, there'll be a small, but I think significant uh, balance available for the next legislature when they decide to get into the state budget. I mean, those are two things that we couldn't even fathom, you know, six months ago. And, and I think it should send a, a clear message to not only the Republican voters, but a lot of those independents that said, listen, we're going to give the Republicans another chance. Uh, we're going to give you the majority in both houses and also the East Wing and we want you to do something with it. And I think we did that, and I think we delivered that. Those six Republican senators, that's their message. I mean, that's what they're out there on the street talking about right now. 
That's what they should be saying in the parades throughout the state and uh, the festivals as we hit that time of the year. If they can get that message through, then I think they'll be all right and, and we'll ultimately keep our majority. But there, that is their message, and I hear you loud and clear. But to get that message to the people so that they really understand and understand what they need to get reelected, how do you do that? Because the, the Democrats have brought in $25 million to their cause, and we have something like $10 million. How do you fight that when we're so under budget with what they've got? Well, you're right. I mean, you know, what's happened is that certainly the other party has uh, linked arms with the unions throughout the nation. Right. And what you're seeing is a lot of those third-party dollars make their way into Wisconsin's elections. Right. And uh, it, it certainly is a concern. But I still believe in the end that our message, concise and as clear as it is, will be able to break through that. You know, they're going to throw some mud at our senators and they're going to take their shots at them. But I think, you know, the people at home, the people of those districts that sent them here in the first place are going to be able to respond. And it's that silent majority. It's that silent majority that voted for Justice Prosser. It's that silent majority that voted for them back in November. They're going to be there. And I think they're going to show up in uh, kind of the dog days of summer and, uh, and deliver and make sure that the votes are there for these six Republican senators to be successful. So you think that an election that is taking place in the middle of summer, July and August, is going to sink in to the voters and they're going to get the message, no matter whether they're on vacation or they're just not watching the news or whatever, they're going to get that message anyway and they're going to donate to the campaigns and they're going to make sure that their guy, their Republican senator, is going to get reelected. You think that's going to happen? Well, we're not taking anything for granted. We have, you know, a plan that uh, reaches out and delivers that message of when you need to show up and when you need to vote. And that's going to be critical. Whichever side has more people show up, on that election day, which looks like it's going to be in August, uh, that's that's where the success is going to come from. Who actually gets their people to the people to the polls? And I don't think there's any question that the other side understands that as well. So it's it's definitely a, an intricate part of what every senator is is going to do. Is going to have to make sure that they get their people to the elections on that day. So what is your plan to do that? Well, I mean, we've always had uh, a good, I think, extensive outreach program in place to voters. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what we're going to have to do is even fine tune that more uh, going into s an unprecedented round of, of recall elections, uh, which, you know, means to some extent you're kind of reinventing the wheel and coming up with a number of different ways to do that. But I mm -hmm. feel confident about the methods that we have, and, and I think our people are going to show up. You think they will, and yeah. I, I hope they will. I'm looking forward to it. I'm counting on it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you so much. Thank you. Senator, it's nice to meet you and nice to talk to you today. And good to be with good you. Luck to, good luck to you. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Who's Right again. And we really appreciate you watching the show. If you have any comments or want any information about the recall election, please email us at whosright.org. We will be glad to answer your questions, and thank you for watching. Good afternoon.